Coming up next is coming to you in just a second, my friends. But before we get into this week's episode, are you subscribed to Coming Up Next? It's really simple to do, and it's going to streamline your podcast listening experience. All you got to do is head to comingupnext.com.au, where you'll find links to all the various platforms that you could be listening to the show on. Hit subscribe, and then it's going to download to your device each and every week, taking the legwork out of needing to remember to download the episode. It's just going to show up for you, and then you can enjoy hassle-free podcast rambles for the rest of your life. Hey friends, week two of 2019 and uh, I hope you're having a very productive and, uh, and peaceful time in the year thus far. Uh, If you're back at work, or if you're not back at work, if you're still bumming around enjoying the uh, summer or the winter, depending on which hemisphere you're in, uh, I hope it's all going very well for you. We're rounding out my curated three from 2018 this week with uh, John Patrick Shanley, an interview that I did with him um, sort of in the second half of last year now. Uh, And we'll be back next week with brand spanking new Coming Up Next podcast rambles. Remember to subscribe at comingupnext.com.au and uh, if you're feeling particularly festive after this festive period, uh, leave a uh, five-star rating and a review for the show. Uh, John Patrick Shanley, uh, for those of you who are not aware, is uh, one of the most prolific contemporary playwrights um, he is uh, he's also an Academy Award winning screenwriter for, uh, for his film Moonstruck. Um, some of the plays that he's written include The Dreamer Examines His Pillow, Danny in the Deep Blue Sea, Doubt. Um, and uh, John invited me to come to his place while I was in New York uh, to tell me all about uh, his career and adventures uh, as, a, as a writer and a director. So anyway, let's get into it. Uh, The final of the three 2018 curated episodes, my interview with John Patrick Shanley. Amazing to sit here with you, looking at this kind of sweeping view of Manhattan. Um, thank you very much for inviting me into your home. Oh, my pleasure. I've, I've, you know, I kind of always am thinking about how do you start these podcasts? How do I start the conversations? Normally, I try and just go into a point of interest or something uh, that's kind of relevant to the person I'm speaking to's current body of work. But I felt like with you and with my current kind of... I've been having this dilemma, I suppose, about how do I keep the podcasting and this show, how do I keep the fire burning for myself? Mm -hmm. Because I'm finding that I'm at a point now where I've been doing it for three years, as I was saying to you before, and I'm not entirely sure how how to keep evolving it. Mm. And I was wondering how you managed to find, or if you've ever had a point in your career where you've had that sort of point where you're like, I don't know if I can keep doing this or I don't know how to keep it fresh, I don't know how to keep it interesting for myself, as well as for the people who are, as well as for the audience. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, certainly anybody of any interest goes through... uh, coming to the place in the woods that's dark and they're not sure which way to go forward uh, or you know trudging through an endless desert in the ever eroding belief that they're going to come to a place where there is water um, and those are both you know decent metaphors for the creative search for fresh fresh vitality wellsprings um, uh, that we all go through but in fact that it's not even creative it's life itself you know how do you reinvigorate reinvigorate how do you make the old tricks new how do you 
find your life again because you know life you you have a life and then you report on that life and then you are distanced from that life in part by your reporting of it and uh, you can you know when you ask somebody like what do you like I mean, what kind of person are you they almost invariably describe who they were uh not who they are uh because uh, the current environment the current space you inhabit is a wordless space that uh, words uh, chase after but never quite overtake. Um, as a creative person, I've been a writer for 50 years <laughs> uh, and easily actually more than that, but yeah. you know, I'll just arbitrarily say 50. <laughs> and uh, I'm 67 now, so I've certainly since I was 11 been doing this. Uh, been doing some version of writing. You know, I started, I was writing little poems and uh, little snippets of stories and stuff like that. But the the organic impulse was there. Do you remember what the, the, the first thing that you ever wrote was? Uh, I'm not sure that I remember the first thing. I remember the sort of genre that I was interested in to begin with, which was kind of Edgar Allan Poe territory. Uh, of you know a guy who has a dream about murdering somebody and wakes up with a bloody <laughs> knife on the pillow, you know that kind of thing. Uh, and a and raven overhead. Yeah, yeah. Not as uh, sort of uh, um, incantory as the raven or Annabel Lee, uh, but uh, certainly slightly flavored by that. And I don't think it was particularly that I'd read Edgar Allan Poe and wanted to be like him, but that that stage of my life that there was an impulse that was similar to the impulse that Poe had. Uh, it was more about that, you know, what his preoccupations were overlapping with mine during that, you know, young time in my life. So uh, 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 I had no, you know, problem uh, writing for many years. Uh, I, I had one problem, and that was that I wasn't writing well. But uh, other than that, things were going swimmingly. Uh, and I, you know, you go through, you have to go through moments where you uh, turn around and you suddenly see yourself and uh, you realize that you have to change. And those are big moments in a person's life, in a writer's life, in an artist's life, and uh, where you, you actually become tired of who you are and um, have to molt like a bird uh, and grow new feathers in order to, you know, survive the next winter. Um, and uh, I've had, I've had, you know, many moltings right. over the years. And, and I would say that actually I just went through one where I, uh, I wrote and directed a play in the fall called The Portuguese Kid, which was a comedy that I did with Jason Alexander and some other very good people. And uh, it was uh, a, a farce, basically, and which has enormous mechanical demands because when you do a farce, once the audience starts laughing, they have to keep laughing. I mean, that's what the job is. It's like, how do I keep this going? And so... You know, the period, the preview period, which was like a month long, was unbelievably intense where I was rehearsing all day and then I was uh, rewriting at night and then I was getting up early in the morning and rewriting again and then going to rehearsal and putting in the changes. And that was going on for like two solid months that I was doing that. And uh, very, very in intense effort. And uh, at the end of it, the, there was a great deal of laughter in the audience, and I came away with I came away exhausted, and uh, thinking, yeah, now I don't want to do that. You know, <laughs> I just did that, and now I don't want to do that. Maybe for a long time. Yeah. Uh, and uh, then I kind of knew. I said to a friend of mine, um, l last year turned out to be a very busy year for me, and theater and then film and uh, I said to a friend of mine in December I said I don't think I'm going to work all next year um, not by choice but by karma I think that everything's going to dry up and blow away now and that's exactly what happened uh, and is that, I is that, a, that kind of cycle has that been 
an experience that you've oh, had over the years? Oh, absolutely, right. absolutely. And um, I, uh, uh, sure enough, like uh, two weeks into the new year, I got a pinched nerve, uh, the sciatic nerve in my leg, which I'd never had before, and it was very painful. And I went to, you know, chiropractor, this one and that one, and nobody could quite heal it, but they all said the same thing. You see, you, you can't sit down. And I'm like, what do you mean? I'm a writer. And they said, no, you, just, you can't sit down. I'm like, well, for how long? And this is what we can't say, but you, you can't sit down. And uh, so I, had, I thought, and I, at first I just went ahead and sat down anyway. And literally, the minute I sat down, I would have an attack. It was that fast. So uh, uh, my body, which was sort of like my neglected wife, had came, come to me and said, you need to spend some more time with me. And we need to go for long walks together. Because apparently long walks are good for this ailment. And uh, I don't really give a shit about your writing. I don't really give a shit what else is going on. You need to attend to the other side of life. And so... After a struggle of a couple of months, me fighting that, I gave in to that, and then things got better. And then I uh, you know, cured the sciatic nerve problem, and I uh, uh, changed my lifestyle a decent amount to become much more physically active. And uh, I didn't sit at the keyboard for as long as I would have previously, but I'd already become pretty good at uh, you know, writing mostly in my head, and then when I sit down, I write pretty quickly. Didn't want to get a stand-up desk? Uh, I talked about it. I thought about it. I never got there. Mm -hmm. I may get there eventually. I don't seem to care uh, about that, you know, whether or not, if that turns out to be the solution, then that'll be the solution. But the original, the big new thing was just like, first the intuition that you're going to go through a period where you're not going to work. Uh, and, of course, because I'm older, you go like, well, it could lead to never working again. And then it's like, yeah, but you can't live in fear. You can't worry about these things. You know, you're going to go on and do whatever the hell you're going to do. And uh, uh, so more recently, quite recently, uh, I and I was writing, a, I started writing a, I wrote, like, in the, in the new year, I wrote a, a new movie on spec, and then I wrote a third of a second movie on spec, and then I also wrote a significant short story in terms of density and language and structure, and it was, and I haven't written a short story since I was 25, and so that opened a door. And I realized that I needed to put aside the second screenplay I was working on and just stop doing anything for a while. And then I immediately wrote a full-length play, right. <laughs> uh, which I now have a first draft of. And so, but you know what that, is, you have to have a certain faith. You can never do the writer's life or the artist's life or the human life out of fear. You've got to, you know, you, can, you, you have to acknowledge that you're afraid that you'll never write again or that nobody will ever want to hire you again or blah, blah, and then go on from there to make the choices that you need to make as an artist and a human being. Yeah. And, you know, looking over your career, at least the work that's been in the public eye, you know, from the sort of beginning of your playwright career in the 80s, you know, through to you know, the early 2000s, there's kind of very clear points where you've obviously had one of these molting kind of moments. Mm -hmm. I suppose in those times, were you aware that that was what was happening? Were you making conscious choices or were you just going with what you, you were feeling in your gut? I would know that I was going into crisis and uh, the, of different sizes. And, you know, one of the things about having lived for a while now is I have now the frame of reference of you have been through this before. Yeah. Um, you know, one of the most wonderful um, reading experiences of my life was the memoirs of Casanova, which is like 10 volumes. And I have read them all and cried when it was over because he basically stops in the middle of a paragraph because he died, you know. Right. And uh, uh, he, t you know, he 
in the, in the start of the memoirs, he talks about these various romantic adventures he has in falling in love with this one. And, and then at a certain moment, uh, a decent way into the memoir, he falls madly over the woman, and he says for the first time, but I had felt this way before. And it's one of the saddest and yet transcending moments in all of my reading life was the moment when I, I heard this guy come to that self-knowledge and what it meant for his future. Uh, and coming to that place in my own life where, you know, felt like I was never going to work again or I never had anything to write about again, he said, I have felt this way before. And that's very consoling and gives you a real sort of base. And reading, you know, like reading autobiographies and biographies of people is very helpful to to know, oh, I'm not alone. I, a lot of other people have had this experience and went on to have very interesting lives. I recently read Bruce Springsteen's autobiography and I was so kind of taken by how, I guess, humble he is in the way that he presents his life and the way that he appears to uh, imagine his life mm -hmm. and how kind of... Um, you know, the kind of path that he's taken to get to where he is today, where, you know, he's been playing for 50 plus years. And I left the book feeling a very intimate kind of understanding or knowledge of, of who this guy is. And it really helped my kind of, I guess, fuel my creativity or my creative soul. So, yeah, I guess to your point about, you know, looking at um, uh, other autobiographies or biographies, to feel like <clears throat> there is this commonality of creativity that exists and people have these common experiences of fear or um, doubt or, or whatever it may be and then find a way to persevere. Mm -hmm. Yeah, actually I've met Bruce Springsteen a couple of times. So one time was at Lincoln Center. We were doing a tribute to Tom Hanks's career and Tom had asked me to you know speak and, and uh, several other people, including including Bruce. And we were backstage and it was um, uh, time for me to go on. And um, I turned to Bruce uh, and he, you know, he had his guitar strapped on, you know, because he was going to go out and sing something from Philadelphia. And uh, I said, could I, could I borrow your guitar? <laughs> and he started to take it off and then he suddenly sort of woke from a dream and he went, you know, I was going to get I was going to give you my guitar. <laughs> I've never told anybody that story before. That's quite funny. <laughs> so he is humble, you know, yeah. as opposed to saying, what the fuck you mean? You've got yeah, yeah, yeah. fuck off. No, he was, he was quite sweet. In the book, you know, he describes being in the room with people like Mick Jagger and he... It's not that he feels like he doesn't deserve to be in the room, but he acknowledges the kind of largesse of these people and, and how amazing it is that he does get to be in the room mm -hmm. with the, these kind of these people who are the top of the game. Um, and I think that's, you know, that was something that I, I suppose I didn't expect going into the book. Yeah. I think a lot of people who find themselves in that situation, you know, find themselves in a, you know, room with, Steven Spielberg and Tom Hanks and whoever, you know, that there is a voice in your head going like, I'm in a room with Steven Spielberg and Tom Hanks and whoever. Uh, but it's an actually, it's, it's a child's voice, really, I think, you know, and doesn't have much to do with uh, the work, you know, the work that you need to do uh, on any given project that you're involved in. Um, I remember uh, one time I wrote this movie, I rewrote this movie that Sean Connery was wanted to do. So they called me up and I said, Sean Connery, you know, suggested your name, you know. And I said, oh, that's, that's lovely. And so they said, you know, would you be willing to talk to him? I'm like, well, sure. So I get on the phone with Sean Connery and I said, uh, you know, look, I'll rewrite the screenplay and uh, you don't have to pay me. Uh, and if you don't like it, just forget the whole thing. And if you like it, then you got to pay me. 
and he's uh, being a Scotsman, he said, oh, it sounds good to me, <laughs> right? <laughs> so I rewrote it, and he did like it. And so they ended up on a plane going to uh, Spain to uh, his compound to work on the, and talk about the screenplay. And um, so I get there, you know, and it's long, you know, you fly to Rome, connect to something else, and now I'm in southern Spain in some uh, rich enclave uh, on the sea, and uh, I go, and then I get in a cab, and, you know, I've been now, I've been traveling for probably 14 hours, and I, I finally arrive at Sean's place, and he greets me at the door, and, and his wife, who's lovely, and then uh, he immediately takes me into the backyard, he said, to read the screenplay. I'm like, I'm like yeah, okay. <laughs> no, so, you know, right. we go in the backyard and he's got a mural by Cocteau up on the wall and all of this stuff. And it's Sean Connery, right? And so uh, he basically says, you read all the other parts and I'll be the hero, right? And so I'm like, okay. So we're sitting in the guy and, and I'm acting all the, and he's, being Sean Connery, and he's reading it with great commitment, and he's a good actor, uh, his part, and we get to uh, a love scene, and I'm the woman, and he's, you know, looking into my eyes, and I'm like, how did I get here? How did I end up in this situation? Um, and uh, <laughs> where I'm, I'm the love interest of Sean Connery. <laughs> James Bond, looking James deep into Bond, my eyes. James Bond is my, you know, my, you know, childhood experience, and then you end up, you know, in the room with uh, the guy and in this completely incongruous scenario. Yeah, I mean, you know, you grew up in in the Bronx mm -hmm. in the fifties, which mm -hmm. I could imagine would be a um, very grounding experience. Yes, uh, and you know. Fast forward to, I'm assuming this was in the 90s that you're writing this uh, screenplay with Sean Connery. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, even, you know, last year, like you said, working with Jason Alexander, you know, you worked with Meryl Streep, meeting Bruce Springsteen backstage, all of these incredible artists. Uh, have you, is there something that you kind of feel is a kind of common thread through these people that has helped them to get to the levels that they've gotten to? from your point of view? Well, they're all somebody, you know? They're not kind of looking at you going like, I'm not really sure who I am, but you know, what, what do you think? Uh, now, they might ask you what you think, but they really at home in their bodies uh, and, uh, and they become very comfortable being Tom Hanks or being Sean Connery or, you know, being Meryl. Uh, and, um, I suppose one of the reasons that I've gotten along so well with people like that is I'm also myself, and so they kind of recognize that, and they go like, okay, so he he's not like reaching, trying to like have some kind of ap apocalyptic conversation with me about <laughs> the meaning of life, or he's just, you know, like, let's get on with it. Yeah. And they're usually very, let's get on with it, too. So we're all on this. They're about, these people are all workaholics. That is the truth. Uh, and so I'm probably the laziest person in every meeting I've ever <laughs> been in because they work like demons. I mean, Tom is doing full staff in L.A. on stage right now on a break between I don't know how many films. He's chosen to go on stage and do one of the most challenging roles in all of Shakespeare in a fat suit. Uh, God bless him. You know, yeah. they, they can't get enough of it. It must be really fun to be an actor because there's no other reason I can think of to do it so much. Mm. I guess going uh, to go back to what we were speaking on before about these kind of uh, shedding or molting moments. Do you feel that through these these moments the, that your process as a writer has evolved? I mean, it must have kind of inevitably evolved through, uh, evolved through these, um, these experiences. But, you know, when it came to writing something like Danny in the Deep Blue Sea or The Dreamer Examines His Pillow versus writing Doubt or even The Portuguese Kid, how, did you, how do you feel your creative processes differed? 
Well, for many years, uh, you know, first of all, you, you know, I became visible to um, a larger audience as a result of Danny and the Deep Blue Sea. So that was in 1984. I'd already been writing plays and putting on plays for 10 years at that point uh, and working on the invisible plane. And I would do, you know, I'd have a production about once a year, once every year and a half somewhere at a small theater. Uh, and uh, and I and people would sometimes say, boy, the play would be better if you did this or you did that. And I would resist all such suggestions because I knew that when I rewrote something, it was worse. I did not have the ability to improve it by rewriting it. It would become more and more false. And so, and I think in a lot of writers have this experience at a certain point. Is that because so, you, you start to overthink I it? just didn't know how to do it. Right. You know, I might not have articulated it that way, but that was sort of the truth of the matter. And then, and then I tried a couple of times, you know, some, somebody would have a lot of notes and said, well, let me try. You know, I did this one play uh, called Rockaway and I, I, I wrote the play and I liked the play. And then uh, I got a director who was very uh, uh, Sanford Meisner kind of actor, uh, which I like Sanford Meisner's point of view very much, and he uh, uh, gave me all his notes up. He's a really old guy, and so he's from like an earlier time, and I said, well, you know, as an exercise, I'm going to do all the notes this guy said. So I wrote, I rewrote the whole play uh, as per his notes, and uh, people agreed that it was better, and I said, yeah, but I don't like it. You know, it's not what I want to do. This isn't what I want to do. Uh, and uh, that was the last time that I took literal notes for a long time because uh, the whole thing was still too mysterious to me. Um, and then at a certain much later point, I began to be able to rewrite, which is a very exciting thing, a skill to develop. And um, uh, and I think it was for do, doing screenplays because they're so structural that you can st you start to get the auto mechanic side of yourself going, and um, it's really it's really helpful uh, in figuring out how to rewrite. Um, and a lot of people who give writers notes don't understand the problem. They like they think they're speaking English to the writer, and the writer's understanding what they're saying, and then the writer simply won't do it as far as they're concerned. They just won't make the obvious necessary changes. But I know it's not a. The first thing a writer needs to know is that you understand what they're doing, and the way to do that is to talk about what in what they're doing is alive. The rest of it doesn't matter. That's just dead. People explaining to you what doesn't work is like describing the space around you when you ask, what do I look like? <laughs> you need somebody to tell you because you don't know. You're in there. You're writing it so you don't know what you're doing. Yeah. And they assume on some basic level that you know exactly what you're doing, uh, what you're putting out, and you don't. And so they need the living tissue of what they're doing described back to them. I mean, I did this one play called Gorilla, which was a, was a very silly play about 10 apes set loose by a misanthropic zookeeper in Central Park, right? <laughs> and it was great fun, and, you know, it was what it was, and I only had limited skills to get it to where it wanted to be. But somebody said something to me afterwards that, in the, and I don't even remember who it was, that changed my life. They said, you know, that one character, there was one gorilla in it that was very inarticulate and uh, in a lot of pain from loneliness. And they said, that was a great character. And I, re I wrote Danny the Deep Blue Sea. I was like, oh, I'm going to do one about, you know, the inarticulate pain, uh, which I knew so well. And uh, it was, you know, said to me at the right time when I was ready 
to express those things. But it was, you know, that kind of, you know, how could you know that that was going to be the thing? But in other words, they were describing, out of a play that had like 14 people in it, one character and just saying, that's the character that's interesting and this is why, and leaving it at that. Hmm. It was a matter of a sentence, the person, maybe two sentences they said to me. And that inspired the... That suddenly revealed to me the living tissue in what I was doing so that I could write a play from that living place. And, you know, they could have said 10,000 things about what was wrong, what could be improved, or what was funny, or, but there was a central thing I didn't understand that I needed to, I needed somebody to mirror back to me. And so from that, well, actually, I, I suppose I'm, I'm actually quite curious if you recall what the opening night of the first show that you ever put on was. Oh, I remember very well. And what you were feeling. Uh, you know, the first show I ever did was at uh, New York University. Uh, I took... I uh, I gone back. I went in the Marines. I'd been in NYU for a year and dropped out. And then I went back after the Marines and a bunch of odd jobs and stuff. And I uh, and got accepted back into it and, and started up again. And I uh, uh, liked writing, so I took all the writing courses, which there weren't that many. And then I saw there was one called Introduction to Playwriting. So I took that, and I he was supposed to the cumulative action of the course was you're supposed to write a one-act play. I saw I immediately wrote a full-length play. <laughs> and uh, it was put on the student body, uh, producing body, uh, chose to uh, put it on, and, they, and it went into rehearsal three weeks after I wrote it. And uh, the director was one of the faculty and he was like an older member of the faculty, and he had all sorts of ideas about what should be done to the play, and also what I thought were very bad ideas. Uh, and so I just stayed away, because I knew he couldn't change the play uh, if I wasn't there. And uh, they put it on, and the actors... Uh, chose not to wear their costumes but to wear clothes that they thought were cool <laughs> uh, stuff like that and then they sometimes you know made up lines uh, and uh, the first performance of the play was in a 300 seat house and uh, the uh, one of the actors uh, said a line that wasn't in the play and it got a laugh and I leapt up and yelled at the audience don't encourage them. <laughs> so I remember it very well. <laughs> you know, something that you've said a couple of times is about, or kind of around the idea of, as the writer, understanding what your stories that you want to tell or what your kind of vision for the piece is, mm. uh, which I imagine is also why you've directed most of your, your own uh, mm. shows. Is that something that you kind of grew into, or is that something that you were just or that you always kind of felt like you knew what your vision for these shows were? My dream was that my idealization was that I write a play and I had handed to a brilliant director who would f make it much better than I had made it and that I would reap all the glory and financial gain from that. And the reality turned out to be that I ran into a stream of incompetent directors who I quickly just pushed to the side and said, no, I'm not going to you know, allow you to destroy my play uh, because you have a dream of control. Uh, and because uh, the directors, you remember they would say to me, don't talk to the cast, talk to me and I'll talk to the cast. And I'm like, fuck that. I'm, I'm going to talk directly to the cast. <laughs> you you got to be out of your mind if you think I'm not going to do that. Uh, I have um, uh, occasionally had you know, happy experiences seeing uh, things that I, didn't, uh, that I wrote that I didn't direct um, and uh, wish that I had more, you know, because I remember when I started directing plays, I'd done a play called Women of Manhattan and I was very unhappy with the result. 
the of the I didn't like the production. And um, I the next one I'm like, oh, I'm directing the next one. That's the story. That's it. And um, uh, it was a play called Italian American Reconciliation. And I uh, did it um, the way that I did it. I gave it to some guys in Los Angeles, uh, a couple of cowboys kind of guys. I, they wanted to do my this play in Los Angeles, so I said, "Okay, I'll give it to you for a hundred bucks," because I just, you know, I like the adventure of the unknown of like these seem like very earnest guys, and you know, maybe they'll do a great job, and. Um, then I got a call from them saying that they just fired the director and would I take over? And I said, okay. So I got on a plane and I went to Los Angeles and I took over the direction of the play and it went very well. And then I uh, did it in New York with the, uh, John Turturro and uh, Johnny Panko and a wonderful cast. And it went very well, and I enjoyed doing it, and I enjoyed working with the designer, Santa Laquasto, a lot, and everything else. But it came about out of the incompetence of a director. They're just sort of like, this guy can't do this. Um, and um, many of the times that I've directed plays have been because I didn't, I didn't see the person who I thought would do a better job. I still like the idea of somebody else doing a better job. They just don't very much. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it makes it kind of hard mm -hmm. to, uh, mm -hmm. to acquiesce. I mean, Bar Barnett Kalman did a great job on Danny and the Deep Blue Sea. Did a wonderful job. Uh, and uh, uh, Doug Hughes did a great job on Doubt. Norman Jewison did a great job on Moonstruck. So I've had, you know, Tony Bill uh, by alchemy because it was a crazy set, did a great job on Five Corners, my first film. So, uh, you know, Frank Marshall did a great job on Alive. Uh, so I've had, you know, a decent amount of, of success using other people and would enjoy to do it again because I'll never forget starting rehearsals for Italian-American Reconciliation in New York. I went into the room stage management tables all set up, my table's there, notepad or whatever, the, and the cast is there. And then, uh, you know, the sort of meet and greet from the producing entity, Manhattan Theater Club, and then the door shut, and I suddenly realized, I can't get out of here. Well, then you're the playwright. After a couple of days, you know, you, you'll say, I'll go out for coffee, I'll be back tomorrow. You can never leave. Yeah. If you leave, they'll stop working. Uh, and uh, that was rough for me uh, because it's exhausting to be in a room with very intense people who invariably get very frightened at about two weeks of rehearsal that they're never going to get it and you're the only thing standing between them and the door. <laughs> it's mm. a, it's a, yeah, and, and that's always, the, it's very, very exhausting to be the playwright and the director at the same time. Do you feel as though your experience uh, in service, uh, you know, during the Vietnam War, helped your uh, work ethic and your ability to do something like be the writer and the well, director? Well, definitely, I became as a reason. I was not in Vietnam. I was in during the time of the Vietnam War, but I was. My brother Tom was in Vietnam. Uh, and I was in the Marine Corps, and I came out of it. When I went back to college, I, when I'd gone to college the first time, I found it overwhelming. And when I went back to college the second time, I'm like, what was the problem? <laughs> this is a piece of cake. <laughs> and uh, so I did. I had learned a great deal. I used to get up at 5 o'clock every morning and write for three hours before I started my day at NYU. And that was kind of great, and I got a tremendous amount done, and I got to do a lot of the bad writing that I needed to do. What sort of things were you writing? Was it just like stream I'd write of consciousness? Anything or? that came up. No, I wrote a novel, and uh, after a year, I burned it because I realized it didn't have a plot. And I <laughs> also all of the papers that they assigned and everything. I would write all of those. So by like eight o'clock in the morning, my major work for the day was done, which is kind of a great feeling. Yeah. Yeah. As you were kind of talking about incompetent directors and not being allowed to talk to the cast when you did have them 
I was, I'm kind of struck by as I'm looking over your life, the threat of anti-authoritarian or like kind of fuck you to anyone who tries to, in a way, tell you what to do. I don't look. I I ascribe to the best idea in the room, and I see it as my job to be the person who has the best idea in the room a decent amount of the time, but also to have the humility and the street smarts to recognize when somebody else has a good idea and take it and run with it. Um, I don't really, you know, I don't like, I don't like judges. You know, I've had a couple of times where I had to deal with a judge and I discovered that I really don't like him. I don't like anybody who sits higher than I do. It, may, it brings out the Irish anarchist in me. I just want to burn <laughs> down the building. It's like, who are you to tell me what I can and can't yeah. do? You know? And, uh, you know, when you go through a divorce, uh, it's an interesting thing because, you know, you're in there and you're dealing with, at a certain point, you're dealing with a judge, and yet you didn't do anything wrong. You know, so it's sort of like, I didn't do anything. Okay, you know, I, I stole this guy's car, and I got to deal with the judge. I don't like it, but I understand it. It's like, I didn't do anything wrong. Why are you in my life? Why are you able to tell me what to do with my life? Uh, but, of course, we do need judges. I just don't like them very much. <laughs> well, I read an interesting, uh, an interesting quote that you said back in 2004, I think, and it was, it's getting harder and harder in society to find a place for spacious, true intellectual exchange. It's all about becoming, it's, it's all becoming about who won the argument, which is just moronic. Yeah. And when I read that quote, I sort of, I was thinking that's truer today than it ever has been. You know, if you look at the whole kind of fake news epidemic. Well, there's a, you know, there's, there's a culture of advocacy and so let's say uh, you know you do end up in a lawsuit or you end up in a criminal proceeding or whatever you end up in and uh, they go seaplane landing oh, wow. uh, they go uh, uh, into court and your lawyer argues a slanted argument to win the lawyer is not committed to the idea of uh, telling the story fairly or honestly, but distorting it completely in your favor. And the other lawyer is doing the exact opposite, distorting it against you. And the judge watches these two distortions and is supposed to apply the law to them. I find the whole thing a little crazy. Uh, you know, the idea of a commitment to, well, who, who is representing the idea, nobody, of what actually happened, what is right and wrong about it. Uh, and in society, I feel that, that, you know, most of our politicians went to law school and they learned that idea of advocacy. And then we ended up with, you know, good television shows, finding a compel compelling television to have people yelling at each other, you know, cr and there were shows like names like Crossfire, um, uh, which suggests violence. Uh, and it is uh, the idea of people donning white robes and going into a place to uh, reason their way to a, uh, a fair outcome, a just outcome, that I don't see where that exists in modern society. It's interesting that through you know, a lot of your plays, the upfront kind of representation with some of these characters is that they're quite, you know, they're, they're big, almost monstrous characters, but you're presenting, you're not presenting a kind of straight and narrow, like, uh, judgmental point of view. There's there's a lot of compassion that kind of evolves throughout it. Actually, again, going back to something that you said about growing up in the Bronx where you felt like the reason that you got beat up a lot was because you could so clearly see who people were and that kind of comes out in your work a lot. I suppose, how do you... Have you found it more difficult as, you know we've gotten to where we are in society now to have that level of compassion or has it been easier to maintain? Oh, yeah, no, I mean, I don't find, I mean, you know, 
the, the, the experience of living, if you're paying any attention, it teaches you that you are guilty of all of the things that these people who you dislike are guilty of, <laughs> just maybe in a, to a different degree. And that if you want to assess people's behavior fairly, you have to start by assessing your own behavior fairly. And if you're really willing to do that, it's pretty humbling. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so when you uh, did move into screenplay writing and um, you know you wrote Five Corners and then Moonstruck, which you won an Oscar for Best Screenplay, did you feel like there there was a quite significant change in the in all the doors? Well, it must have been a, in all the doors that were opening for you. But then, in choosing which ones you wanted to walk through, there must have been a, a bit of a challenge. Well, it was you know it was really moonstruck. I mean, uh, Five Corners uh, was released by a, a Cineplex Odeon, which doesn't exist anymore and at the time they never distributed a film they didn't know anything about it George Harrison put up the money the Beatle for it yeah, well. and yeah what was uh, he like uh, never met him right. uh, the director did the producer did the writer didn't um, I mean arguably the best Beatle uh, but you know uh, it was a nice thing to that George put up the money and um, uh Moon, but you know it, it was released and it disappeared almost immediately and then uh, I did Moonstruck and that was that was a big deal um, a very successful film internationally as well as in the United States and uh, then at that time the video cassette of uh, Five Corners came out and that's when my phone started to ring because nobody had seen the film and then but everybody went to Blockbuster back then. And so then they all saw Five Corners, and uh, it was sort of a double opening for that reason. The Moonstruck and Five Corners sort of hit just a, you know, a couple of months apart, really. Um, and, yeah, all, you know, all the doors opened. And at a certain point, I um, ended up working with Steven Spielberg for several years, uh, invisibly and visibly. Right, and uh, that was that was a very good collaboration. Was that at, uh, at Amblin? That was at Amblin, and uh, Frank Marshall and Kathy Kennedy, who were at Amblin at that time as well. And then after they left Amblin, I continued to work with them as well. So this would have been like the late eighties, early nineties, really in uh, the kind yeah. of sweet spot of his yeah. burgeoning career. Uh, actually, when I met Stephen. Was it was probably a point at which he was about to. He was kind of missing a beat, right? Uh, and he, because um, uh, he was about to do or was in the process of doing Hook, uh, which did fine financially, but you know, it's not anywhere near his best work or more or most interesting. As, work. A, as a child of the uh, late eighties and early nineties, I have very fond memories of watching and, Hook. And <laughs> as well, you should. I did another movie with him uh, called We're Back. Uh, and an animated film, which I discovered to my horror about animation, that when you're in post-production, you're still in pre-production. <laughs> that anytime Stephen had another idea, it was going on for like years, and he'd pick up the phone, it's like, it's over. It's ne it was never over. Yeah. Uh, and they would make a couple more tweaks, and then they'd have to animate that, and then he'd go, ah. uh, But that was an interesting thing to do, and people who were little kids at the time that movie came out going you wrote that's the biggest thing I did as far as they're concerned because it's that moment in your life you know when you're sort of soft wax and things really really leave a, a profound impression uh, but uh, yes all the you know I found myself in Hollywood uh, and uh, in a circle of people that was movie stars studio heads and directors and producers at every party at every, and it's just, it whatever I went to it was the same people and I was like bored mm. I got bored and I I felt like I was sort of losing my oxygen supply so I lived in a hotel in Chateau Mama for like a year um, making Joe versus the volcano which was a gigantic thing because it was five months of pre-production 
77 days of shooting, six months of post-production. <laughs> it's just like, wow. will this Endless. ever yeah. and then can I ever, ever go home? <laughs> Not live in a hotel room. Uh, and it was, a, you know, Chateau Marmont, I think they're like apartments, so wasn't that bad as, that, as far as that. But I was really homesick. And then when I came back to New York, then, uh, you know, the New York press didn't like the movie. And I took a lot of shit for it. Uh, and uh, I, you know, had to, I had to hit one of those places where I had to reinvent myself and reassess what I was doing and also crash emotionally big time, which took a couple of years. Um, was it difficult to yeah. to kind of step into the idea of not pursuing a career in Hollywood anymore? Was that well? I was go? never, you know, I always wanted to go home. So um, it was, and I continued to work in the film business um, I, uh, quite a bit. But I, I was trying to figure out, you know, what was a good fit for me, what made sense for me. Uh, and it's very, I mean, you know, one of the terrifically difficult things about Los Angeles is it is a one industry town. I remember going to the dry cleaner and him talking about the grosses of my film. And I was like, this is a nightmare <laughs> yeah. in New York, you know, no 90% of everybody doesn't give a shit what your film did. Yeah. Um, and out there, you, the dry cleaner treats you different if your film doesn't have a good weekend. Yeah. It's that extreme. So that's, that was not that was not for me. It's an interesting culture, uh, and it's uh, right now it's in the in the midst of a uh, deep transmogrification that will the where it's going to come. You know, the studio system is really on the ropes, uh, and the you know they have their tempo movies and the sort of human movies are going to Netflix and Amazon if they're going anywhere and nobody really knows what that means either uh, so we had the sort of heyday of you know cable shows like Breaking Bad and Sopranos and stuff and then we got into this thing now this territory where nobody knows what the hell's going on really uh, and I'm, I'm happy that I'm not in Los Angeles and this is my whole life yeah. and I have to deal with it all the time. It must be rough right now. Well, I was speaking with a writer in, uh, in Los Angeles. I was there last week and he's a, a fairly prolific uh, horror film writer mm -hmm. and he said to me, Silicon Valley has eaten Hollywood. Yeah. It, it, actually, they're eating everything. Yeah, right. <laughs> it's not just Hollywood. <laughs> I mean, uh, you know, Amazon just, they bought Whole Foods, and now they just bought a drug delivery company. Uh, so, you know, they want to go into prescription drugs, right. movies, uh, you know, shirts, <laughs> you know, like whatever you need, yeah. food. Uh, and they, I mean, nobody even knows what it means uh, to have one company be the conduit for so much and have the potential to be the conduit for everything. So after your experience of, uh, of, of living in Chateau Mamel for a year almost and coming back to New York, you know, you said that there was a couple years of, of coming down from that experience. Mm -hmm. When did you know that, you know, this malting this particular malting experience was uh, was finishing or coming to its evolutionary. Well, a, lot of, a lot of stuff, you know, happened because I had uh, a, a, during that period adopted two children at birth, uh, and uh, which you know that was enormous. And then I went through a divorce. And that was enormous. It's the other side of life, you know. It's the pinched nerve. Yeah. You know, you have to attend to all of these things. And uh, that, all of that, you know, soaked up a lot of time and uh, life force and attention, as it should have. Uh, and, and I rode through all of it. You know, I've had this actually this what i call uh, uh, the closest thing that i've been to blocked was probably this year 
and I've already written three scripts. <laughs> so I'm like, well, if that's blocked, then I don't yeah. know, you know. So, um, what do you think of the idea of writer's block? Um, well, I mean, I know it's real. It's just like, you know, clinical depression is real. And uh, the fact that I uh, am not clinically depressed is something I should be grateful for rather than go like, well, I'm not clinically, it's all, nobody's clinically right. That's, of course, the insane narcissistic point of view of uh, people who just never know anything about life. Mm. And I guess that kind of comes back to your, that empathy or compassion that, you know, speaking about before. Yeah, you see people, I mean, you know, there's this uh, guy, uh, playwright and uh sometimes television writer, um, uh, Stephen Adley Girgis, very good writer. And uh, he has managed to make writing look like the most awful thing a person could do. He just, I mean, the way this guy suffers, procrastinates, and, and I guess you could say blocked, except he's writing all the time. He just talks as if he's blocked all the time, but he actually is producing pretty much all of the time yeah uh and uh i've you know i always you know like back when i was working with phil hoffman um i you know, and i would watch him in his dressing room in between you know times when he, when we were shooting and he was so miserable i remember saying to him i said you know if acting if this is what acting is for you, why don't you just do something else, you know? And, um, of course, what I didn't understand was acting was the one thing that was working, you know? Uh, so it it can be so easy to misapprehend what you're seeing. Um, uh, and, you know, that that was all that stood between him and, just, and total destruction, and in, the, and in the end it didn't. So people have, you know, we often get it backwards about people. You have an, a, a, a writer who's blocked. If they tell you they're blocked, they're telling you something. And it's... Um, and there's probably other words, other doors to be opened, other avenues to get into what exactly is going on with them. Uh, and I'm just, you know, I'm thankful that I've... Um, not had a great deal of suffering on that front mm. a lot of uh, writers and actors who I know feel like they need that kind of suffering to create and you know there's I guess there's fear around this, the well of suffering drying up as well if they do too much you know right. therapy or work oh, or whatever Eugene O'Neill did want to have therapy for that reason um, and I think Arthur Miller also resisted it. I can't remember for sure on that front. I know O'Neill wouldn't do it. It's like, you want to tamper with the, the magic <laughs> the or whatever, you know? Yeah. Do you think, I mean, obviously, you know, everyone's experience is, is going to be unique to them. What's your take on that? Oh, though? I don't. I, I think that actually that's just plain nonsense. But, uh, you know, that, uh, in other words, that there is no sacred space that a writer may not enter to see what is there. That their job is like, it's like, okay, like a, if I'm afraid to go to a psychiatrist, I probably should go. Yeah. Uh, if, uh, uh, you know, I mean, I've been to therapy a number of times, always in an emergency. Uh, and uh, sometimes I knew it was an emergency and sometimes I didn't. But I've never had any interest in going long term because I, I said, well, um, when I stop paying this person, I no longer have a relationship with them. I don't want to share some of the biggest moments of my life with somebody who's going to pull the plug and disappear. I want that to be friends, family, things like that. Um, but each, you know, each to their own. Woody Allen, I'm sure, has had a long and rich therapeutic life <laughs> <laughs> yeah uh, you mentioned uh, Philip Seymour Hoffman before was was the time that you're referring to when you shot Doubt was that the period of time when you were referring well, I, to I knew, I knew Phil before that for some years because we both uh, were members of the Labyrinth Theatre Phil before me uh, and uh, I, I, I came into it and uh, 
he was one of the producers of a play of mine, Where's My Money, um, at, at the Labyrinth, which I think was the first play that I did with them. Uh, and then we used to go on vacation together down to South Carolina to the beach with his kids and his uh, in, in de facto wife, Mimi, who was a lovely person who I knew as well as Phil. Um, and so I, I had a pretty long relationship with him. Mm. And so what was it like when you came to making Doubt into a film to be working with him and Meryl, you know, this kind of all-star cast? Yeah, well, you know, basic. I mean, you know, uh, I asked Phil, you know, I offered Phil the role and uh, he said, oh, you know, I have so much going on, but uh, I'll, I'll look at it. So I sent the script over and he called me next day and said, I'll do it. And uh, then he talked to a mutual friend of ours, and he said, I'm, I'm a little worried about working with John. And I said, why? And he said, eh, you know, two alpha males. <laughs> and um, then later, after we were doing the film, he said to another mutual friend of ours, he said, I, w- I was wrong to be worried. I like John as a director, which I will take to my grave because... Phil was not like an effusive guy. (laughs) Uh, And we were not, though we went on vacation together and worked together, I would never say that we were close. Uh, I, you know, certainly deeply respected his talent, but we were just very different kinds of people. And I think that he was probably more one tiger to a hill kind of a guy than, than I was and am. Yeah. I feel like, you know, we could probably keep talking about this and about your career. I mean, we just keep rambling on for, for a while. Um, and we've only gotten up to doubt. I'm really grateful for you uh, allowing me to come into your home and look at this sweeping view. It is nice, isn't it? It's, uh, I mean, it must be... Uh, oh, look, there's a fireboat with all the hoses going right there. I saw that going before and I was wondering what it was. It's a fireboat. It just seems to be spurting water onto water. Well, they have to test it once in a while. Right. You know, when there's a fire, it's too late. <laughs> <laughs> you you make a very good point. It must be uh, incredible to kind of wake up and see this view. And it is. I'll tell you, ironically, what I said when I first moved in. So I said, "How is it? You know, to wake up with that view every day?" And I said, "I feel like I'm on a permanent vacation in Sydney." Really? <laughs> I've never been to Sydney. But this is sort of, you know, that sort of a lot of sky yeah. and the water right outside. And it just seems a little more carefree than any other place I've lived. Yeah, my my uh, my brother uh, lives not too far away from here. And he has this amazing view from his rooftop mm-hmm. of, uh, of Manhattan. And I definitely just kind of sat there in awe of what I was looking at as, a, as an outsider, someone yeah. who, you know grew up in small town Melbourne um, yeah. to kind of see, you know, there's the Empire State Building, there's yeah. the Chrysler Building and the World Trade Center. It's, uh, it's Ooh, now look at the fireball. Now oh, wow. it's going full, <laughs> full bore. Holy mackerel. The jets of water are going up, I would say, 50 feet. And they're going, there's like eight of them. So they're just testing it right now. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's kind of magnificent. I've never seen that before all the years I've lived here. Wow. Well, I'm glad we could share this experience. That's together. true. A fountainhead. A fountainhead. All right. Well, good talking to you. Good talking to you. I, I, uh, I have one more question, which, yeah, is, okay. which is how I end every, uh, every podcast. Yeah. The question is, what makes you silly? Well, I have a real uh, silly and whimsical streak because I, I am a certain kind of Irish person. Yeah. And uh, so whimsy is a weakness of mine. And uh, uh, I have to be careful in my writing. Occasionally I will get too whimsical. Yeah. Uh, and uh, I've discovered that people don't really like that. <laughs> <laughs> have, you, have you had a particularly negative... I try to confine it to my life now yeah. outside of writing. Yeah. Yeah. Have you had any uh, any particularly negative or positive experiences from your whimsy that it might have gotten you into or out of trouble? Oh, you know, I've always had a part of my personality that I call the mad scientist, and it always starts the same way. A voice in my head goes, 
I wonder what would happen if I, and then fill in the blank. And it might be just to say to this, a visibly homicidal maniac that I think that he has a very nice smile. <laughs> <laughs> I've done, and I've done a lot of things like that, yeah. you know. <laughs> well, you appear to be unhinged in a certain way. Are you a little, are you a lunatic? <laughs> <laughs> I've been physically attacked for it. Right. <laughs> Thank you so much, Sean. All right.